Okay, it's my great pleasure to welcome my friend, Mladen Vestvina, to give his Austin House Lectures uh, today and Tuesday and Wednesday. Your friend, why are you looking at the notes? I'm just nervous. So, he's a, he's a distinguished professor of mathematics at Utah, maybe a little bit of biography. He, an undergraduate at University of Zagreb, and two years later got his PhD at University of uh, Tennessee, his thesis on, on universal properties of Menger spaces, which I'll say something about in a minute. And then he was a long, he was a Sloan Fellow, Presidential Young, uh, well, young Investigator, he's a Fellow of the AMS. He was at UCLA from 1984 until I don't, 1992 or something. He was a speaker at ICM, at the ICM at, in Beijing in 2002. Um, here's a story. So I, for Dan Bergelli, I remember the, the, first, the first year, in 1984, the first year I was here, first time I ever really looked at job files and I looked in the topology job file this is he went to a tenure track job in UCLA then but um, I looked at his file and it was the best file I ever saw but that it just said uniformly this is the best graduate student we've ever seen the best graduate student who's ever been at, at uh, Tennessee and I said yeah but Manger spaces. <laughs> I remember telling Dan, yeah, about Manger spaces. What do, we, you know, what do we know about that? But then it was, but it was within, you know, a couple of years later that they turned out to be, uh, I mean, now boundaries of hyperbolic groups, or some hyperbolic groups are Manger spaces. It, was, uh, it turned out to be a, people give talks on that all the time. And so within, I don't know when you really started in geometric group theory, but it was, uh, he's an apologist in geometric group theory, but he, he was doing stuff mid or early 80s. And uh, I just want to say the people that I hang out with consider him the, the preeminent geometric group, group theorist in the world, really. So, a lot of best <laughs> Well, thanks, Mike. That's very kind. Um, you know, I, I, you know, if I didn't know it was about me, I wouldn't have recognized this. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, I'm, I'm very glad to be here, and thank you for the invitation. This event was supposed to occur two years ago, and then you know, everything shut down. And in fact, this is my first trip outside of the state of Utah in, in you know, two plus years. Um, so my, my concept for these lectures is that they're aimed at non-experts. So, uh, you know, I, you, if you, and, and they're also independent of each other. So if you miss one, you know, feel free to come to the next one. You won't, you know, you, there won't be anything that I'll use from the previous lecture. Um, <clears throat> and my goal is to feature, you know, groups and spaces and techniques that we love to use in geometric group theory. And, and also, I mean, subjectively, I chose them because maybe I played some role in, 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 those, in those things, but so it's not completely uh, objective selection. But still, I think, I think it, will, it will give you a, a good idea of what, if you have never seen any talks on geometric group theory, I think this will be a, a good sample of what we do. Okay. And also, feel free to interrupt me if you have questions. I, I've kind of I got rusty in you know, giving in-person talks. I don't, on Zoom, everything goes faster. <laughs> so I'm not sure what will happen uh, today. Okay. Um, okay, so today's topic is Morse theory. And I will start by reminding you of the stand of the classical smooth Morse theory. And then, and then we'll go on to PL Morse theory, which is really what we'll use in applications. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so just uh, recall Morse theory. And, and also here, if you've never thought about this, I highly recommend the classical Milner's book on Morse theory. And what I'll say here is just the first few pages of the book. Okay, so this is smooth Morse theory. Oh, this breaks. 
Um, so M is going to be a smooth manifold. Is, is this loud enough? Can everybody hear? Yeah? OK. So it's a smooth manifold. It just keeps breaking. Um, and, and then f is going to be a smooth function. Okay, smooth function. And then we, we have a, a point, and we like to look at critical points of smooth functions. So p in m is a critical point, and what that means is that, uh, all, that the derivative at that point is 0. So, or equivalently in local coordinates, all partials are 0 at that point. Well, whenever that happens, then there is a well-defined, you know, f defines a certain quadratic form in the tangent space of p. And in, in local coordinates, this quadratic form is given by the Hessian. Okay, so we'll say that p is non-degenerate, okay, if, um, if the, the, the determinant of this Hessian matrix is non-zero. In other words, this quadratic form is non-degenerate. Okay, now um, there is a there is a Morse lemma and there is a Morse theorem. Okay, those are the main two things in Morse theory. So the Morse lemma is that um, in local so if p is non-degenerate, degenerate. Then, then f near p is completely standard. So you can find local coordinates. There exist local coordinates. Uh, so where, where p is the origin, p is 0. And the function, so f of um, x1, x, say, uh, n, let's say the manifold is n-dimensional, uh, is, is just uh, there's some constant, which is really f of p, I guess. And then, and then you have just a, a quadratic polynomial with uh, a certain number of negative signs. And let's call that number lambda. And then the rest are positive. So x, x lambda plus 1 squared plus, plus xn squared. Okay? And not only that, but this lambda doesn't depend on the choices. Lambda is really the number of negative signs when you diagonalize this form. So it's independent of any, any, any choices. You, of course, there are many different local coordinates where the function looks like this, but uh, the, the lambda doesn't depend. So lambda here is called the Morse index. And, um, and, and the function is called Morse. F is Morse if, if, uh, if every critical point is non-degenerate. So, so these, these standard forms, these are things like when n is 2, we draw these things in calculus all the time, right? So we have, a, uh, you know, here's, you know, if, if n is 2, then you, you, you know, you draw a picture like this. So we, we think of f as being the height function, you know, the z coordinate. And uh, so we have a surface, and the point p is at the bottom, it's the minimum, and uh, this is where lambda is equal to 0. So the, the, you only have plus signs here. And then there is the, uh, the, the saddle, you know, like this, um, and like so. So this is, uh, this is the case when, when lambda is 1, right? So you have 1 plus and 1 minus. And then finally, there is the local maximum, which looks like this. This is the case when lambda is 2. Okay, so all the in, all, all these critical points look look completely standard, and the, the the standard form depends only on this lambda. Okay. Um, the significance of lambda topologically is that it describes uh, the space of descending directions. All right. So, for example, if I'm uh, looking at the saddle and I want to know in how many different ways can I descend from this point P? Well, really two. I mean, you can go, you're in a saddle, right? You can go left or right. There's no other way to go down, you know? Well, I mean, you, you, you sort of have to define what, what you mean by a descending direction. Maybe you can say, well, I can maybe go at an angle or something, but up to homotopy, say, uh, up to homotopy. There are two ways of going down. In other words, the space of descending directions is homotopy equivalent to the zero sphere in this case. 
Over here, the space of descending directions is a circle. It can go down you know, in a circles different ways. And here it's empty. And, and so all, it's always true that the space of, the space of descending directions at P is, is homotopy equivalent to the sphere of dimension lambda minus one. Okay, so that's somehow what this index uh, signifies topologically. Okay, and um, then, so that was Morse lemma. There is the Morse theorem. Okay, so for simplicity, let's say that we have a, a proper Morse function. So proper just means the preimage of a compact set is compact, and maybe it goes, um, maybe it goes to zero infinity like this. So this is a proper Morse function. Bonded from below. Bonded from below. That's why I have you know, zero here. Yeah, bonded from below. It doesn't have to. It could be minus five, but yeah. bonded from below is the important thing. Um, then, then um, M is homotopy equivalent to a cell complex um, with whose cells are in one one correspondence with um, the critical points of F. <clears throat> and the dimension of the cell is equal to the index of the critical point. Okay, so in some sense you can read off the homotopy type. Well, not exactly because this is not telling you what the attaching maps are. But still, it'll, it'll give you a lot of information just by examining the critical points of this function. And the picture you're supposed to draw here, this is, uh, I mean, yeah, I'm just wondering if this is visible. I mean, it's probably not visible to everybody, but. Okay, um, so here's a torus in three space and I'm looking at the height function. That's going to be a Morse function. And this is R, okay, just a projection to the Z coordinate. And there will be four critical points. There is, um, so here's index is zero here. It's the local minimum here. It's two because it's the local maximum. And then there are two critical points of index one over here. There are two saddle points. Okay, so we have zero, one, one, and two. And we all, we all know that you know, torus, in fact, can be cellulated by a, a one, zero, one zero cell, two, two one cells, and a two cell. But you, what you're really supposed to notice here is how the sublevel sets change homotopy type. As you, so you can think of pouring water here, and then uh, you know, when this, so the homotopy type of the, of the water will change when you pass through critical points. So don't, if you cut it off here, it's empty. And then you go over here and you see that it's a disk, right? So it's a disk, which is really, a disk is certainly contractible, but it's also homotopy equivalent to a point, uh, which it corresponds to the zero cell. And you should think of this as being a thickening of a point because we are th talking about a two manifold here. And so the pieces should be two dimensional. So this is called a handle, okay? A thickening of a cell is called a handle. In this case, it's a zero handle because it's a thickening of a zero cell. Now what happens next is you, go, you go get past this first uh, uh, critical point with index one, and what happens is you see a picture like this. Okay, this is the sublevel set when you when you cut it off just above the uh, this first critical point, and this can be thought of as being you know this this is really the same thing as taking the sublevel set here, which is a disk, and then attaching a one handle that is a thickened one cell. So here, here's what it looks like, you know, so it's like a little bucket here and you have a handle to carry it, okay? And then uh, when you go, you increase the water level further and you end up with a, with a, you know, a picture, oops, like this, right? And this is really the same thing as the previous picture, well, which is this one with, a, Running out of space here, but anyway, uh, with a, with another one handle attached like this, right? So you know because the, we are passing through a critical point in X one, 
in, in homotopy, this corresponds to attaching a one handle or, or just uh, or, or attaching a one cell. We don't care about uh, you know, thickening. And then finally, right, to go from this picture to the whole torus, you're attaching a two cell. Okay. Okay, so that's, that's the classical Morse theory. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm also reminded uh, of, of a story uh, that kind of had some influence on my mathematical career. When I was, when I was young and, and you know, at the beginning of my career, Raoul Bott was at the end of his career. And he's, uh, he was a big pr practitioner of Morse theory and he proved many good theorems. His, his proof of Bott periodicity is one of my favorite proofs in all of mathematics. And you can find that proof also in Milner's book. So I was, uh, he was giving a colloquium talk and I was in the audience and he started out by saying, every mathematician has a secret weapon. Mine is Morse theory. That was the first thing he said. And I was sitting there thinking, well, it's not so secret anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so uh, this is the, the brief review of, of the usual Morse theory. Now let's go over to these boards and, and talk about PL Morse theory. Okay, so this is going to be a, a, a kind of a simplicial complex version of, of that. Okay, so this, this comes from uh, my, my paper with, with Noel Brady from many years ago, uh, where we used it to, to think about finiteness properties of groups. And if I, if I don't run out of time, I'll, I'll, I was planning on, on telling you some of it, that story. Okay, so let me start just by defining what PL Morse theory is. So here we're supposed to replace manifolds by simplicial complexes. Okay, so the definition is, um, let me just make sure I use the same notation here. So X is going to be a simplicial complex. And, and we have a function from X to R. Okay, so this is called uh, PL, uh, is, is PL Morse. If, so there, there are three conditions. So the first one is, we, uh, this kind of uh, is the analog of the Morse lemma. We want, we want the function to be somehow standard locally. We want to be st standardized. Your critical points are always going to be at the vertices, okay? And so what I want to know is that if I restrict my function to any simplex, then that function is as standard as can be, namely affine, right? That's sort of the, the simplest. So, um, so the first condition is that this is called affine. So for every simplex um, sigma, let's say, uh, let's say it has vertices um, I don't know, v0 through vn like this in x, right? If I look at f of some point in the simplex, the point in the simplex will have various center coordinates. It will be some convex combination of these vertices. So I take uh, the sum the sum of the ti vi, so that's a typical point in the simplex, I want that to be just the sum of the ti f of vi, right? So it's just, an, it's just saying that it's an affine function on each simplex. Okay, that's, you know, it's standard. Uh, locally, it's standard. And now we have to worry about, uh, we, we want the vertices to be the only, the only critical points. So this is called no horizontal edges. Okay, because if, you know, a horizontal edge, then you wouldn't know what, what sort of singularity that is. So you, you, you want to say that if, if f restricted to sigma is constant, then, uh, then sigma is a vertex. Okay, you feel like you should perturb, one, one thing about Morse functions is that any, any smooth function can be perturbed to be a Morse function. So the same thing here, if you have a, uh, one of these affine functions and it happens to be constant on the simplex, well, you can just perturb it a little bit, okay? There's a kind of somehow generic. Um, and then number three is a kind of a technical condition that, that you know, plays the role of this, you know, here uh, the, the function was proper, so they're only kind of in any, in any kind of a level here. Uh, they, you know, they're only, you only see finitely many vertices or at least or at least the image, you know, at, at least these uh, happen at discrete levels uh, of the function, you know, the critical points. So, um, uh, so this, uh, this so f of the 
the zero skeleton, so the all, f of all the vertices in R is, is closed and discrete. OK, so that's it. This is the definition of what the PL Morse function is. <clears throat> OK, um, any questions about this? Yes, you can have infinitely many vertices that all map to the same point, but you have to you need a little neighborhood so that nothing there are no other vertices in that neighborhood. You have the neighborhood given by pulling back a, a, an interval from R. Okay, um, okay. So now I want to I want to discuss the, this concept of, of descending directions. That's somehow the main thing in Morse theory. You want to know what happens. You know, in how many ways can you go down? Okay, so. Um, um, okay, so let's say let's say v is an x; it's a vertex, and I want to look at the simplices that contain v as a vertex. So a simplex, a simplex sigma that contains v is is uh, descending, right? So this just means that it's below the vertex, right? So if, uh, if the f restricted to sigma uh, realizes max at v. Notice that because of no horizontal edges, the vertices will all descend to different heights. And there's exactly one of them that will be the highest. Okay, and, and if v is the highest, then you call the simplex descending. It's all below v, okay? And uh, the, the descending link I'll give an example in a minute. So this is the uh, this is the notation that I'm using. Descending link at V. Well, this is going to be the, the link of V with respect to the union of, of all descending simplices. Union of descending simplices. Okay, maybe uh, and yeah, and then similarly for uh, for similarly. The ascending link. You know, just to uh, make the obvious changes. Yeah, in, in smooth Morse theory, we could have also talked about ascending directions, and and that's just uh, you know the, the how many ascending directions. Well, it's also going to be a sphere whose dimension is you know n minus one minus lambda, right? So the dimensions of the two spheres will add up to n minus one. Um, and here, or you can you can also change the sign of f, right? And that that does the same thing. Okay. So you can define the ascending link by defining ascending simplices, where v is minimal. And the ascending link is the link with respect to the union of the ascending simplices. OK, so let me, let me just uh, give you an example that will, that's probably a, a better thing than, than to try to decipher the formal definition here. Uh, so here is, so again, my, my uh, function is just going to be um, the height function. So it's like this. So I want to kind of display as many phenomena as I can in one example. Uh, yeah, like this. Okay. So here's here's my x, and the the function is just a projection to the to the y coordinate. This is, x is in the plane, and I'm projecting, taking the just the y coordinate. And and the vertex is the one in the middle here. Okay. So the simplices of interest, the descending simplex. Simplices are, you know, so there's this two simplex, and then of course there are also these edges, and then also this two simplex. Okay, that's the uh, th those are descending simplices, and so the uh, descending link in this case is just the link of V in this yellow subcomplex. So it's just the, so the link uh, is, you know, you think of, you know, drawing a small sphere around the vertex. So in each simplex, the sphere will cut off. A simplex of one dimensional less. You know, this, the, the space of directions that go down within that simplex is exactly once you know the, the simplex of one dimensional less. Okay, so this this red object here is the descending link. Okay, and the ascending link is um, well, it's it's three points, right? There are exactly three three uh, simplices that are ascending, and the link is a single point in each of them. Okay, this is the 
ascending link. <clears throat> Notice that this kind of sideways simplex doesn't contribute to anything. If I, if I completely erase, I have to leave the edges in, but if I erase the simplex, the, the ascending and descending links will stay the same. Also notice that ascending and descending links don't have to be spheres. So here it's three points, okay? So they can be any kind of a simplicial complex. Um, I mean, of course, if the space is locally finite, then descend, descending and descending links will be finite simplicial complexes, but there's no restriction on the, on the homotopy type. Which makes uh, the PL Morse theory, uh, you know, maybe uh, more prevalent than, than, you know, but on the other hand, it's maybe harder to compute than standard Morse theory. Okay. Um, okay, so now let's, uh, let's talk about the PL Morse theorem. Okay, so we, we assume we have a, a, a PL Morse function. PL Morse, and I take a, a closed interval in R, like this. Okay, so there are two statements. One is that if, there, if we don't see any critical points, right, uh, that map into this closed interval, then nothing changes to the sublevel sets. The, the, the homotopy type will stay the same. So if, uh, F, if F inverse of J contains no vertices, Um, then, um, then F inverse of, of J, or F, uh, let's just say AB, deformation retracts to F inverse of A, and so, and hence, you know, F inverse of minus infinity A is homotopy equivalent to F inverse of minus infinity of B. In other words, if you're interested in homotopy types of sublevel sets, nothing happens between A and B. So you can see that in, in like in this example here, if I take you know this to be the level A and here is the level B, well nothing happened here. In fact, they're even homeomorphic. Um, and you can you can prove this by some induction on you, know, you construct this deformation interaction by induction on, on dimensions here. Yeah. You start with one simplices, right? So one simplex deformation retracts to a point. And, and then you already have deformation defined on the, kind of on the boundary here. And just, anyway, it's, it's certainly easier to prove this than, than, the, than in the smooth Morse case where, where you have to think about the gradient flows and such. Okay. Um, now the interesting case is what, what, what if there are critical points, right? So, so for simplicity, I'm going to state this uh, assuming there's only one vertex in this F inverse of J. So if F inverse of J contains only one vertex V, and F of V is not A or B, it's, it's in the interior of this interval, okay? Then, uh, then F inverse of mi minus infinity B is obtained from F inverse of minus infinity A by attaching the cone on the descending link. You're coning off the descending directions at V. You know, they, they, were, they were different you know, before you reached V, but, but then when you reach V, they all get collapsed into the same point. So, it, so, uh, union, so union over the link, descending link at V of the cone on the link. Okay, so you're attaching the cone on the, uh, this C means cone. Okay, like uh, here, well here, uh, you know, when the descending link is contractible like it is in this picture, then, um, you know, coning it off doesn't change the homotopy type. So, so in this case, this uh, theorem is telling you that the homotopy type didn't change when you get past B. Okay, so uh, the, the descending link here is empty at this bottom vertex. And so you're coning off the empty set. That means you're starting out with something empty and then you cone off the empty set, you just get the cone point. So you just have one point, right? So in other words, the space is contractible when you get past this first vertex. And then the descending links over here are contractible. They're just a single point, so nothing happens. 
until we get to V, but then nothing happens either because the descending link is contractible. And nothing ever happens because the descending links here are also contractible. Now you could also turn the picture upside down and, you know, and fill the water the other way, and then does, something does happen. Then you have three, three vertices that have empty links, empty descending links, you know, so you give yourself three points. And then when you get to V, you're coning off three points. So those three points get coned off, you get something contractible, and then after that, nothing happens, okay? All right, so that's, the, that's, that's what Morse, field Morse theory is. Okay, so now uh, I want to talk about some applications. Uh, half hour. And the main, I, I, I have three, three main examples. That I want to that I want to um, show you. Um, okay, so the first one is about an object of interest in not only geometric group theory, but I think in, in a lot of mathematics. And it's um, <coughs> it's it's the teeth building of a of a vector space. Okay, so let me talk about that. Um, okay, so no, this doesn't really erase well. Um, okay, so three examples. So the first one is going to be about uh, so the, the, I, I'll prove uh, something called the Sol Solomon Tietz theorem. So K is going to be a field, and then we are looking at this n-dimensional vector space over K, and we define a simplicial complex, Xn of K. This is called the, the Tietz building, and it's a simplicial complex. So vertices are, vertices are just um, proper sub vector subspaces of K to the n. So they're, um, so V and KN, vector subspaces, so, but there, you don't count uh, zero or K, all, all of K to the N. They, they don't, it has to be a proper subspace, okay? And then um, simplices are flags. Okay, so what's a flag? Well, it's a nested sequence of subspaces, okay? So flag is, um, so there are, so zero is not V1, and then you have some sequence like this. It doesn't have to be, uh, it, you don't have to have a, you know, a full, full flag. That is, uh, you could skip some dimensions. And then this is not, this is not equal, sorry, not equal to K to the N. Okay, so K could be one, for example, a vertex is a simplex, or it could be two of them, and then that's an edge, and so on. So for example, if, if N is equal to, uh, to two, you have a two-dimensional vector space, so you just imagine the plane. K could be R, for example, if you want you can visualize this. Then, uh, then vertices are just lines, yeah, one-dimensional vector subspaces, and there are no flags, I mean, other than, than the lines. So in other words, this is then a discrete, so X two of K, is a discrete set. And when n is equal to three, then you, you have, so you imagine R3 and you have lines and you have planes. And you put an edge between the line and the plane if the plane contains the line. Yes? So if n is equal to two, then here's my space, and the only proper subspaces here are lines. But lines can never form flags other than just, yeah. So there are no simplices other than the vertices, okay? Um, okay, when n is equal to three, then it's a little more, more interesting. X3 of k is a graph. In fact, it's a connected graph, okay? And that's a non-trivial thing here. Uh, it, it's clear that it's a graph because you'll have, uh, you'll have flags consisting of a line in the plane. They'll form edges, but you won't have any two simplices, right? Because the only Flags are you know, one-dimensional and then two-dimensional, and then you're not allowed to take three-dimensional. 
Okay, and the, the bit about connected is a special case of the Solomon-Tis theorem. And, but you can see this directly. Like for example, how do you connect two lines in R3? Well, they will span a plane. And they're both connected to that plane. In fact, this space is, has a very rich geometry. It's, it's, it's an example of a spherical building. And, and us the usual proof of the, of the Solomon Tis theorem that I haven't stated yet is through the theory of, of buildings. But in fact, there's a very simple proof that you don't have to know anything about buildings, uh, just to PL Morse. So this is what I want to show you. I want to give you a proof of the Solomon Tis theorem, which I'm going to state next. And I'll give you uh, just a, it's a, it's a short proof. Say that again. When when n equals when n equals three, yes. then then it's a graph. Is that right? What graph? Well, it depends on the field. So if the field is infinite, right, you'll have infinitely many. It's a it's a bipartite graph. You'll have infinitely many lines, and you and they form a discrete set. And then you also have infinitely many planes, and they form a discrete set, but you know, uncountably many. I mean, you can take a finite field, and then you can actually draw a picture. Uh, and, then, and then some lines, it's a bipartite graph, because some, you know, li some lines are contain some planes, but not in all of them, right? So it's some kind of a bipartite graph. Okay? Actually, this probably doesn't happen. The, the shortest cycle has you know, six edges. You can check that. Okay, um, so the theorem, the solomon Tis theorem is, is that um, Xn of K is homotopy equivalent to a wedge of, of N minus two spheres. Okay, so for N equals to three, it's a wedge of circles. So that, that means it's a connected graph. And for N equals to two, it's a wedge of zero spheres. Well, that doesn't say much, but it's a discrete set. Okay, uh, proof. Okay, so I want to define a Morse function, f from xn of k to, now it's not going to go to r. So you kind of have to tweak the theory. That, you know, that statement is not the final statement. You know, in every application you have to tweak it a little bit. So here, what, you know, the, the art of applying Morse theory is to come up with good functions. Right? If you come up with some function that's not good, you'll have lots of critical points, and maybe they, they won't reflect the homo. They won't be simple um, in the sense that you'll have sort of canceling critical points that you don't want. You want efficient Morse functions that only reflect the topology. And so here, the, the correct thing is, uh, this, this will go into the following set, 0, 1 cross, and then 1 through n minus 1. Now, I'm going to lexicographically order this set. Okay? This is ordered lexicographically. And then uh, it becomes a, you know, a finite linearly ordered set, and I can embed it in R, preserving the order. Okay, so this, I can view this as a subset of R, but for an order preserving embedding. So that, that, that becomes, so this is lexicographically ordered. <clears throat> so anything that starts with zero is smaller than anything that starts with one. And, and if they're equal, if the first coordinates are equal, then the second coordinate decides. And this function is just, so f of, let's say p, p is my plane, my, my, sub, my linear subspace. I'm going to send it to, okay, so first, actually I forgot to say, uh, we, we are going to pick, you see you have to break the symmetry somehow. You're not going to be able to do this equivariantly. There, there, there's a natural group acting on this, namely, uh, you know, GL n of k is acting on the space, but you'll have to break the symmetry because if your function is equivariant, then, then it's not going to, uh, you know, you'll have too many critical points. So uh, L is going to be a fixed line. You're going to pick a line and we'll fix it, yeah. Arbitrarily, pick some line and fix it. And then F of p is going to be either, it'll start with zero or the second coordinate is always the dimension of p just the linear dimension of that subspace. And the first coordinate is going to be zero if P contains L, and otherwise it's one. If P contains L, 
and it's one dimension p if it does. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So now let's uh, let's examine what the critical points are. So this defines a, a Morse function, right? I can extend it to the simplest is using the using the uh, you know f-line coordinates, the better standard coordinates, and I can um, um, I can examine I can examine. So so notice that there are no horizontal edges because if I take Two, if you take an edge, well, the, the linear subspaces, uh, you know, the, presenting the two vertices will have distinct dimension. You know, that's what an edge is. It's part, you know, it's part of a flag. And so the second coordinates are going to be different. So, so there are no horizontal edges here. Okay, now, um, okay, so, so descending links. So let's just discuss descending links now. Um, okay, so the minimum is at uh, zero, one. Right, that's the smallest possible value, and that's exactly L. Okay, so the descending link is going to be empty if P is equal to L. That's the only uh, minimum of this function. Okay, so this is your water level is rising, and you hit, you know, now you're non empty when you, when, you, when you pass through that point. You're going to be contractible. You're adding a column and point, you're, you're, so you're contractible after that. Now it turns out it's contractible a lot of times. So um, uh, if P contains L, so it's going to be contractible if P contains L and it's not equal to L. Okay, so why is that? So imagine you have a, some, some subspace that contains L. Maybe I won't uh, you know, draw, uh, write stuff, but I'll just wave my hands. So what is the, what is the descending link here? Well, it's, it's subspaces of P that contain that contain L. But that's a cone on L. L is a cone point. Every, you know, L is going to be joined to anything that, that, that's contained in P and contains L. So it's, it's a cone. Okay? That's why this thing is contractible. Okay? Um, now what about P's that don't contain L? Okay, so there are two cases. So it's going to be contractible, contractible, if P does not contain L, but the dimension of P is strictly less than N minus one. Okay, so if you take some, so now imagine you know, you're picturing an R3 and you have a line here, L, and there is another line that goes this way. Okay, so why is the descending link contractible? Well, how do you go down from a line like this? Well, I mean, one way is to, inc uh, to you know, so, so the first coordinate is one here. So one way to go down is to make the first coordinate zero, right? And that, in other words, you can add L to P. Another way to go down is to take a subspace of P. Okay, so the point is this is, uh, this is a cone. This is also a cone on, on the span of P and L. Okay, the span of P and L is, is smaller than P because it contains L. So the first coordinate is zero. But anything, anything that, con that contains P and contains L, you know, if it has the first coordinate zero, will also contain this. So it'll be, you know, and, and then there is also stuff that's contained in P, but that's also uh, joined to PL, to, to the span of P and L. So maybe you have to think about this slightly, but it, it's, it's a cone on that, on that vertex there. And this is why you need the dimension P to be strictly less than minus one, because otherwise the span will be the whole space. And that, that, that's, that's not legal. Okay, and then, so what happens if the dimension is n minus one? Well, then the descending link will just consist of, 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 the, of subspaces of P. And P is n minus one dimensional, so you get the Tietz building in one dimension less. So it'll be, it's, it's homotopy equivalent to x um, n minus one of k if P does not contain L and the dimension of P is n minus one. Okay, so, so what's the picture of this, right? The, the, the water level kind of picture. So, so we have this L at the bottom, and then nothing happens until you get to, uh, until you get to the, um, the, these, uh, the, this fourth case here, until you get to spaces where uh, this, this, num this, this is maximum real. It's one n minus one. And when you get to that, then, then the cartoon picture is like this. I mean, 
right? This is the homotopic picture of this. So this is where the descending links are uh, copies of xn minus, you know, they're xn minus 1 of k. Everything is contractible until you get to that. Now you have to remember what happens, uh, you know, when you, so you're, you're, you're building a space by attaching a cone. Now the space is contractible until you get to the very top. And so the attaching map doesn't matter, right? If you homotope the attaching map around, that doesn't change the, the homotopy type of the, of the space obtained by attaching. And um, so instead of coning off something, you could, you could use the constant map to do the, the attaching. In other words, you're, uh, you're adding suspensions on xn minus 1 of k. Right? When, you, when you attach something with a constant, you attach a cone using the constant attaching map, then that's like gluing on a, a sus suspension of the space. Well, by induction, this thing is homotopy equivalent to the wedge of spheres one dimension less. When you suspend, you get dimension n minus 2. So you're just adding these cones, uh, these suspensions, to a contractible space, and so you get uh, the space homotopy equivalent to a wedge of spheres. Okay, so maybe there are some little things here to think about, but this is really the whole proof. Um, so now use induction. And you can, if k is a finite field, you can, you can actually count how many spheres there are. You know, from, from this picture, you can, you know, it's a finite number and you can count how many there are. Okay, I was going to show you an example from configuration spaces and, you know, I, I guess people who do robotics like this kind of thing. But I, I will, I'll skip that in the interest of time and, and just talk about finiteness properties of groups which was the main application in this paper with Brady. Um, so, um, any questions? Yeah, I also thought that after, uh, when you talk about the FD contractible, you're also talking about the descending, descending link. link. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so finiteness, so the classically, right, people talk about groups being finitely generated or finitely presented, but how do you, how do you, for example, prove or construct examples of such groups? They're, so let's say you want a group that's finitely generated but not finitely presented or, or you know, some, they're also higher dimensional versions of this. Um, so, um, Okay, so I'll end up just having two examples. <laughs> okay, finiteness, yeah, zoom, zoom goes a lot faster. Finiteness properties of groups. Okay, so I want to give you an example of a group that's not finitely presented, but it's finitely generated, and then how you prove that it's not finitely presented using Morse theory. Okay, and so um, what I want to, start with is, well, it's, uh, so there is a free group of rank two and it, the basis consists of A and B. And I can, um, I can think about this group, you know, normally what people do in, in geometric group theory is they, they have a picture of the Cayley graph in this case. Well, it's a Cayley three here. It's the universal cover of the, of the wedge of two circles. Right? So you have, you know, you're imagining this picture, okay? So maybe this is one, and there is A, there's A inverse, there's B, and there's A, B over here, and so on. Okay, so there's a tree like this. Let's call it T for the Cayley tree. And then I want to look at the homomorphism phi from F2 to Z, which, um, which sends both A and B to one. So phi of A, phi of B is one. Um, so I guess I'm maybe a, sl a slight confusion here is I'm using the additive notation for Z and multiplicative notation for F2. Okay. Um, and so I, I'd, like to, I'd, I'd like to then extend this phi to a function on T, okay? So, that, so there's going, so phi extends. So, so the, the vertices of T are exactly the group. So I know what, what I want to do on each vertex and I want to extend it in an affine way. So F, F from T to R, this is going to be an affine extension, extension of, of phi. And you can see that that's a Morse function, 
I mean, if I take an edge, I take an edge, and uh, the edge is not going going horizontally. I mean, you, you are adding one or subtracting one depending on whether you're you're going you know adding a or a inverse or b or b inverse. <clears throat> okay. Um, now I, I really want to bump up the dimension to two. So I want to consider. Um, I really want to consider f2 cross f2. We could discuss this too, but I think the, the, the better example to think about is, you know, I take, say, phi tilde that goes to, from f2 cross f2 to z, and it's just a sum of the, of the two phi. So phi tilde is just phi plus phi. You take, you evaluate phi on each coordinate, then you add them up. That's what, that's a homomorphism here. There, there are four obvious generators in this group, namely a1, b1, 1a, and 1b, and they all go to 1. Okay, and then, and then I can also do the corresponding f tilde that goes from t cross t to r. Yeah. Uh, this is also just the sum of the two f's. This is f plus f, but it's a, it's a Morse function. It's a Morse function on t cross t. Now, one slight technical issue here is that t cross t is not a simplicial complex. It's a cube complex. You know, a typical cell is going to be like a, a, a one cell cross one cell that's a square. Well, Morse theory works with, with cube complexes too. Or if you, if you really want, you can, you can, you can triangulate each cube uh, without adding any new vertices. And, and then it will um, be what, you know, something we, we already know about. Okay, so f tilde is a Morse function. Now, that one is harder to draw. I can, I can draw f. Um, or at least I can attempt to draw f. So what does f look like? Well, I have uh, what identity, and then I can, I can go uh, to level one. So this is kind of at level zero. And then I have a, and I have a inverse at level minus one, and I have b over here, b, b inverse over here. That's a level minus one. And then I have maybe, you know, there's a, b inverse here, and b, a inverse. And there is b squared, and so on. You can you can kind of try to draw this tree. It pretty soon gets messy, but you you can that, that's something you can kind of uh, in your head you can think about. You can you can kind of draw this tree uh, in, in such a way that the function f is is the height function. And then what are the the descending in and descending links? Well, you know at every point every point looks the same. There will be four edges coming out. Two will be pointing up, and two will be pointing down. So both descending and and ascending links are the zero sphere here. Now, what happens? What happens with the, the product? So this is the one we are really interested in. What are the descending and ascending links here? Well, first, what what is the link of a of a vertex when you take the product of two things? Okay, so this is something that, that you know, people in you know, like PL topology know in their sleep. But it, you know, it's just the formula is that the link of, say, VW, so you have two vertices, one in each coordinate, the full link is going to be the join of the links. So you take the, take the link of, of V in, in, in the first coordinate, well, this is with respect to T, and then you join, you know. So here, for instance, the link is four points. And then, and then, so in, the, in T cross T, it'll be four points join four points. So you have four points here, four points here, and you put all edges, you know, from this side to that side. So there'll be 16 edges. <clears throat> now, the same principle works for descend, ascending and descending links. Exactly the same principle. And, and then maybe that's something we can also think about. But the descending link at, you know, VW, this is going to be the join of the two. The two, which is uh, S0 join S0, okay? Which is a hollow square. It's a, uh, you know, so it's a, homo it's, it's a circle, it's S1, okay? So the descending links and also ascending links for, by the same principle are circles in this example. It turns out that's what makes the group not finitely presented. Okay, so let me, you know, okay, in the remaining five minutes, I think I can, I can explain that. Um, Okay, so first of all, what does what what does um, you know Morse theory have to do with uh, or, or you know how, how do you topologically tell if a group is finitely generated or finitely presented? Okay, so that's a to a topologist like me, 
Um, so these are facts. This, this is almost a definition. So uh, a group G is finitely generated if and only if it acts, it acts um, let's say, freely and co-compactly on a connected graph. So if you, if you know uh, about Cayley graphs, then you can see the one direction here. If the group is finitely generated, it will act on its own Cayley graph, and that, that's good. But go, going the other way is maybe a, a little more involved exercise, but it, it's not more than an exercise. Okay, so let me, let me prove that this group is finitely generated, which, oh, I didn't tell you which group, <laughs> the kernel. So the kernel of this homomorphism phi tilde from F2 cross F2 to Z is finitely generated. You can prove this directly algebraically, that, uh, but, but the point is this method generalizes quite a bit. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> okay, so the, the claim here is that, so you see this group F2 cross F2 is acting on, on this uh, whole space. In this case, it's T cross T, but you know, the picture is only T. But it's, it's, it, it acts by shifting the levels. So if I, take a, if I take an element in F2 cross F2 and I send it to some integer by phi tilde, let's say five, well, that means that, that all the levels uh, go up by five. Okay? In particular, the kernel is exactly the level-preserving subgroup here. Okay? Level-preserving subgroup. And so it's going to act co-compactly. So let's call this kernel H. So H acts co-compactly <coughs> of level sets. And so what, what, what you have to prove using this fact here is that the uh, that the level sets are connected graphs. Okay, that's what we'll prove. So claim level sets are connected. Okay, we'll do this using Morse theory. In fact, uh, everything we need is on the board. Okay, so how do we prove this? And, and again, in the interest of time, I won't write the actual proof, but I'll just raise my hands. Suppose the level sets are not connected. So I look at, I look at the, pre so they're not connected here, obviously, uh, because they're just discrete. But in, in you know, two-dimensional version, T cross T, then, then the typical cell here is a square, and the level set will cut it in, a, in, a, in an interval. And so these things are, are you know, they, they have a chance of being connected. So, okay, suppose they're not connected. Then what happens when you, uh, when you go up, so you, you, you're, you're looking at the level set, and now you start increasing the water level from that point on. So what happens is that you, you pass through a vertex, and then what happens? You're attaching a two-cell, because the descending links are circles. You're attaching a two-cell. Well, when you attach a two-cell, you have to pick a component. You, know, you can attach it to one component or another. You can't, but because circle is connected. You can't go from one component to the other. In other words, by attaching two cells, you're not going to make these sets connected. If the, level, if the level sets are not connected and you start increasing water levels, it'll remain connect, disconnected. The, the components will stay the same. But when you're all done, you, know, you have half space here. You know, the, when you go all the way to infinity, you, that's half of your space. And it's still not connected. Now you can start going the other way and using ascending links. And the ascending links are still circles. And you keep attaching two cells until you get all the way down to minus infinity. And all you've done is taken the level set and attached a whole bunch of two cells. That's still not going to be connected. But that's a contradiction because, because this uh, you know, three cross the three is connected, it's contractible. Okay? So it, it must be that the level sets were connected to begin with. That, which proves that these groups are finitely generated. Okay, now I, I, okay, maybe just in, in two minutes, I'll tell you how to go about proving that they're, they're not finitely presented. So there's a similar fact for finitely presented that if, maybe I'll just state one direction here. Um, so if, if G acts co-compactly on a connected graph, that cannot be, that cannot be made simply connected by attaching finitely many orbits 
orbits of two cells, then G is not finitely presented. Right? I mean, like Z plus Z. Well, you know, your Z plus Z is acting on the plane with translations, and it's acting on this one-dimensional grid. But you can make that simply connected by attaching uh, a single orbit of two cells. Namely, you fill in these squares. That's just one orbit. That's because Z plus Z is finitely presented. But in, in groups that are not finitely presented, you keep, you, you, you keep large, finding these larger and larger loops that are not filled. And you, you stick in a two cell to kill that loop, but then there's an even larger loop. Okay? And, and so uh, what you have to show is that these level sets have these larger and larger loops. Well, if they didn't, then, then this, this thing would become um, simply connected in some finite uh, sl you know, slab here. You know, these loops would get filled in eventually because T cross T is contractible. Any loop that gets filled in gets filled in in finite state. And so you, you would end up showing that you know, finite stages here are simply connected. You know, sufficiently large finite stages are simply connected. But you keep adding two cells. When you attach a two cell to a simply connected space, you increase second homology. But that second homology never gets killed because you never attach any three cells. And that's a contradiction because T cross T is contractible. You can't ever, you, 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 so what must be happening is that you know, these two cells that you're attaching, they're killing larger and larger loops. And therefore the group is not finally presented. Okay, so I ran over time, sorry about that. Thanks. <laughs> Yes? Uh, the, uh, this group, okay, so it's something like, I think there are four generators. Um, I think it's like, uh, uh, let's see, a, um, I think like a, a inverse, a B inverse, uh, maybe B A, B A inverse and uh, so, something like that. I, I don't remember. I think there are four of them. You, you can also read that out from Moore's theory. Uh, although, that, that, you know, maybe that, that takes you know, another look here. But they're, they're all of this type. So you have to make sure that one of these is plus and one, one is minus. And, and, you know, and alternate A and B. I think those, are, those will generate. Any more questions? So uh, another thing, it's a way to, let's say, starting with a group, let's say with the whatever, and provided that you've started with a Kelly graph, do you, do you have a situation where you can really computationally see that if the group is not uh, finitely presented? Uh, well, to me, this is the, this is the situation, and they explain it very clearly. But uh, in general, uh, supposing that you have the possibility to draw to, 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 to make a program to build the Kelly graph, and the action describes the action, and this is to verify, it's a way to deciding that this is not uh, finally presented. Uh, no, I mean, I mean, this is, there's a fair bit of luck involved here, right? Whenever you do more theory. Uh, you know, it could be that, like here, we're lucky that all cells that that we are, we are attaching are, are have the same dimension. Like if we were attaching two cells and three cells, for example, it could be that we're attaching some silly two cell and then immediately killing it off with the three cell. Right. So you, you you yeah you have to. There is quite a bit of luck. There, there's sometimes a way to prove that a group is not finally presented using using uh, you know algebra. You can maybe compute second homology of the group and see that it's not finally generated, and that's only guarantees. There are actually examples, that was sort of the point of this paper that, we, that I wrote with Brady, that there are examples where algebraically you cannot see. So, so if you have a, a group with finite classifying space, then you can write, take the universal cover, and then you can write the chain complex in the universal cover, and that gives you a resolution of Z by free Z G modules. And, and such a group that, that has a finite you know, resolution like this is, is called of type FP, or FF, I don't know. So there are groups that have type FP, they are not finally presented. Okay, so it's somehow, from the Morse theory point of view, you, you arrange a situation where these descending links are acyclic but not simply connected. And so algebra doesn't see that this group is not, doesn't have finite type. But, 
But the, the, the problem is that you, you still have, uh, it's like, like here, you know, you have, you have these circles. But they don't have to be circles. As long as there's something not simply connected, then you, you, you're sort of in trouble in finite presentation. Okay, so that's, that's sort of what came to mind when you asked about how we get. I, I mean, if you just give me an abstract group, say here's a group and you use it finitely presented, I don't think this will help you because you, you don't have any good Morse functions in general. Yeah, but from the Morse theory point of view, it's just having spaces that are not simply connected but, but are acyclic or homologous. Yeah. Just a, like to say there is a machine that just takes something you know and does something you don't know. In retrospect, that's why we always get counterexamples of the policy. <laughs> yeah. Acyclic spaces and acyclic. So, any more questions? 